he thought I was the one that locked the camper up. Nobody could get in it. Now he got to figure out how to get the doors unlocked. So he's instantly pissed as soon as he sees me, boom, slams my head into the side of the camper. And I'm like naked in front of everybody, like holding my head, like what the hell just happened? But I'm a kid. So I'm like, shut up, Jackie. You don't want to get your beat again. And I didn't even do anything. I remember like all my family, like that's when they seen it. That's when they were like, he does her up. He, that, that was true. She wasn't lying. And that's when they started to like, peep it. Welcome to Chopping It Up. And today's conversation is with Jax Long. I just finished this conversation with Jax not more than 15 minutes ago. She literally just left. And I'm still blown away. I'm still thinking about a lot of the things that we talked about. She talks about abuse from her grandparents. She talks about having drug addicted parents that didn't take care of her to the point of CPS coming. She talks about being abused by the grandparents that took her from her parents. And she gets into a lot of very deep subjects about how her brain has turned the trauma and things that she went through as a child into who she is today, how she has overcome these things, and also how the abuse from other men in her life when she was very young made her into a promiscuous woman that uh, she really, you know, has a lot of trouble comprehending, but through therapy and through different sessions that she's done, she has been able to lean into what happened to her. And um, she talks about it really well, man. I think she has a lot of great information, things I never understood, things I still don't understand, but just like these subjects are things that I don't think people touch on enough. And how it shapes your life is basically what this episode is about. The trauma of our childhood shaping our lives, how we lean into it, how we run from it. Um, And it's just a great episode. So sit back and relax. I hope you enjoy this episode of Chopping It Up. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Uh. Jax, what's up? What's up? What's okay. up? How you doing? I'm good, man. How are you? I'm good. I'm glad I'm you're good. excited. I'm yeah, glad I you're am excited. excited. That, I like yeah, that. This I like that exciting. energy. When my sister tagged me in the post, I was like, oh, at first I like questioned it. I was like, how how uncomfortable to just be like, hey, here's my life. Right. Yeah. But it is. It takes a lot of courage to come on and talk about some of the stuff we've been through, for sure. Yeah. It does. Yeah. So introduce yourself, man. Tell us a little bit about you. I'm Jackie. Jacqueline. I go by Jax. Um, I'm 29 years old. I'll be 30 at the end of the month. Uh, I'm a Gemini. I'm crazy. I okay. have a daughter. She's 12. Her name's Marley. Uh, I'm the second oldest out of four kids and a stepbrother. Um, I'm a bartender. Been a bartender for a long time. Worked at the same job for years and years. Oh, yeah? Where you work? Applebee's. Okay. I've been there for, it'll be 11 years in September. On 50? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. My so. buddy Ronnie goes there all the time. Ronnie? Yeah, that's, yeah. My, that's my guy, bro. <laughs> I grew that's up with his daughter. I grew yeah, up with yeah, his daughter. Lord, yeah, yeah, Laura, yeah, Nikki, Laura, whatever. We Everybody just, calls her something different. We were, me and my sister were just talking to her earlier okay. this morning. That's crazy. Sweet. That's crazy. Yeah, small world, right? Very small uh, So world. are you from around here? Or? I am. I am. I'm from here. So I was, uh, I was born in Petersburg, West Virginia, like never really lived there, maybe like six months of my life don't remember it too much my parents separated probably when I was like six years old but I've grown up here Cape and Bridge I don't know if you know any of the McGrains Mm-mm. okay well that's my family the McGrains are my family um Joey Long I don't know if you know who that is that's mm-hmm. my dad Jennifer McGrain that's my mom so yeah I grew up here went to James Wood Hanley and Millbrook okay what year was your graduation date 2012. Okay. 2012. Um, yeah. So. So you finished high school? I didn't. Okay. Me neither. I didn't. I didn't. But who cares? I yeah. Yeah. Care. Yeah. I didn't. I went all the way, and my sister ended up passing May fourth. So a few few days ago was her 12 year death anniversary. Okay. And I was supposed to graduate in June. So I, all my senior year, I. Had a baby. My sister died. Her fiance died too with her, and then I was just like, "So was that a car crash?" It was a motorcycle accident. Oh wow! It was a motorcycle accident. It was apple blossom. Um, I was with her the night that it happened. 
Okay. And we were downtown. I had just had my daughter, and she was. I had my daughter in February, so she was roughly two and a half months old. And we were downtown Midway, chilling, hanging out, drinking. Her and her fiance were on a crotch rocket, and they left. They left the party downtown, and we're drinking and driving, and speeding on 81 and a cop tried to pull them over and they f- they fled oh, they fled man. from the police officer yeah and uh he he smacked their back tire he he it was a it was a big thing it was a big thing that was like investigated and it was just it was a hot mess it was it was like you're the police so you're right type of thing like okay. nobody really had a say with any of it my mom so, like, was trying the- to the car hit the back tire of the motorcycle? Uh, the cop car. Okay, the cop right. car. Yeah, the cop car hit the back tire of my, my sister and my brother-in-law, and they fishtailed, and they smacked into a van and died. Wow. The van was full of kids. Literally, it was like they had just left the carnival. The parents said they were going to Burger King to get their kids ice cream. And that intersection where Burger King and Denny's and what is that, 11? Okay, sheets. yeah, Rutherford's Crossing. Yeah, what gotcha. is that? Is that 11? Rutherford's Crossing, yeah, 11, 37, into 37. Yeah, yeah, so it was right there, right there uh, in that intersection. Yeah. It was... And it wasn't near as built up back then as it is now. <clears throat> no, no, it wasn't. Um, The Taco Bell, yeah, right. the Sheets was there. But... but still, like now the laws are that they're not supposed to chase. And I mean, Even then it was. It was it? Yes. So Even nothing then. happened to the officer? Uh, he, got su- he got suspended paid leave. Suspended paid leave. Oh, yeah, yay! For yeah. two lives. Yeah, and I mean, like, and they were on a fucking motorcycle, man. Yeah, they were going. He said that he clocked them. Hit the tag number and let them roll. <sighs> yeah, but see, and that was the thing too. Like, he knew that he knew he was dead ass wrong. He he went to my grandparents' house. You know, like after the fact, oh, you gotta right. go there and be like, hey, I can't tell you over the phone that your granddaughter's dead, right. but I gotta come to your face and tell you. Hey, your granddaughter died. I was chasing her. Or he didn't say that though. He was like, "Oh, they did. They refused to stop." Mm-hmm. He said, "I slowly followed behind them to make sure they were okay." But there was like so many witnesses that were like, "No, he was chasing them. This is what happened." Like he was going so fast that after he hit, after they hit, he almost like ran my sister's head over because he was going so fast behind them. And when she flew off, he was like this close from like running her head over. So it was just like, dude, you're lying. But and I went to I went to high school with his daughter. So it was like, I'm not gonna drop. I'm not gonna mm, name drop because right, right. I'm not trying to get sued. Mm-hmm. But I went to high school with his daughter, and I'm just like, oh my god, like, how how can you live with yourself? Like I would literally, my my mom would always be like, I just want to talk to him. Like I just want to talk to him and ask like mm-hmm. why you felt like you had to do that. Because mm-hmm. he said that he clocked him going 97 and a 70, and then they hit up to 113. He said. And then they crash. That's what he said. He said they ran the, they got off 81, hit that, hit that light right there. It was a red light. He said they ran three red lights. He said my sister turned around. And when she turned around, he said they crashed right after she turned around and looked at him. And I'm just like, I don't believe what he says, though. I don't, I don't believe anything that the officer had to say. I believe, like, the people around that were, like, you know, everybody, I, I worked with one of, the the girl she lived downtown and she said she heard the sirens and like you could just hear like how many police officers were going Mm -hmm. and there was like people at taco bell and sheets that were like yo we like heard it coming off the exit we were watching him like he had his lights on he was chasing them as fast as he could to get to them because he wanted them he Mm -hmm. was like oh they're they're speeding they're taking off they're running they're running for a reason and i mean they were running for a reason my brother-in-law was not supposed to be driving like he had already had, I think, two previous DUIs, and he had a blow and go in his truck. So the only reason they took the crotch rocket was so they could drink. Right. So it was like, dude. All the circumstances led up to a horrible situation. Horrible, tragic. It was probably that was the, that was that was it for me. That was oh, that was it for me. That one did me in big time. Like she she changed my life with that. She changed my whole outlook on life when she when she passed away. So, how, like, was you using them before that to just trigger you? So, okay, so a little background on me. So, both my both my parents crackheads. Both my parents they smoke crack for. 
I was addicted to crack when I was born. So my mom was smoking crack when she was pregnant with me. And this ain't nothing to bash my mom or nothing. It is what it is. So um, starting off with that, that's obviously already, I'm going to have something going on with me because my You're mom right. was a user. Right. So um, I remember my name's Jacqueline. So I remember being in kindergarten and I remember like not wanting to talk to nobody, not wanting to answer questions. Like I would be like, ADHD, like I'm not paying no attention to nothing. Like teachers would ask me questions, I'd be like spaced out, like had no idea what they're even asking. So I remember, like now that I look back, I'm like, damn, like I really did have like some issues. Like my mom nicknamed me Jax because they was like, hey, like I don't, I don't think she, she can really spell Jacqueline like that right now. She's in kindergarten. That's a long name for her to spell. Like we should shorten it to Jackie. And my mom was like, well, what about Jax? So Jax has stuck with me since I was a little, little kid because yeah. I just was spaced out. Like, and it was just the trauma growing up, like everything that I was going through. Like I was one of those kids that like, I was just like, oh, this is, all this is going on around me. I couldn't process everything as fast as it was happening. So starting with that, <laughs> um, we got taken away. We got taken away from my parents. I still remember the day I was like, in kindergarten, I went to a private school. I went to a private school. I went to Sacred Heart Academy. Okay. My grandparents put us in a Catholic school because they was Catholic and they wanted better education for us. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it did anything for me. I mean, I learned. I learned a lot, but I, I, I wouldn't do that for my kid. I would have never did that for my kid. But I do think that they did it. All with the best intentions, all with the best intentions. But I feel like that also caused some things in my life, going to a Catholic school and everything mm -hmm. that I went through there. So how does that work? Are you going home every day or you yeah. stay at the school? Yeah, so we would go home every day. So when we got taken from my parents because they were smoking crack, uh, basically how we got taken was a big fight broke out. They was They were smoking crack. The drug dealer came. My mom went outside to get it. I, and I know all of this because now that I'm an adult and I look back, I'm like, that's how the scenario played out. And yeah. I remember it. So I remember my dad going outside because he thought the dude was trying to holler at my mom. So he busted his windshields out. They're arguing. Drugs are involved. Police get called. You got four kids inside. I think there was like seven kids inside because we had whoever their friends were kids mm -hmm. there too. Mm -hmm. So the police get called and they, they're they like, oh, y'all got kids in here and y'all are doing drugs and drinking and f***ed up. So we call on CPS. So the next day CPS shows up and they're like, we're removing all these kids. We're taking them. And my grandparents showed up and I remember sitting sitting on the back of my grandma's Explorer and I was so little my feet couldn't touch the ground. because How they old were just, you? I was probably six. Okay. Six or seven. My feet were just dangling. And I was just watching it all go down. And I'm like, where are we going? And Nana was like, you're coming with us. And we went with her and then we never left. So. <clears throat> so you had no understanding at that time? like Hell no. Right. I, I would just cry for my mom. Okay. That's all I was doing was crying for my mom every day. Like, I just want my mom. I just want my mom. So my parents split. I, they were in a Catholic school. We was in the Catholic school first. We we were still in the Catholic school while we was with our parent, with our grandparents, or mm -hmm. with our mom, and our and our dad. And my grandparents put us. They they paid our tuition because they wanted. They knew what my mom was doing. They my mom my grandparents owned a business. My parents worked for them. They embezzled a bunch of money from them because mm -hmm. they was on drugs. So they knew everything that was going down. For sure. So that's one of the reasons why they was like, oh, we're taking these kids. We don't want these kids to grow up like this. Right. So we go to the Catholic school. Um, my grandparents would take us every day, pick us up every day. It's, I don't know if you know where it is. It's on Amherst. Uh, Sacred Heart? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've heard yeah. Of Sacred Heart all my life. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've, known, I've known about it all my life. And then the other one was like Randolph-Macon where they had like yeah. the military In school. In Front Royal. Yeah, that was a threat when I was a kid. Same. Yeah, Same. right. We're going to send yeah. you to Randolph-Macon. Yeah. No! Yeah, yeah. And yeah. then there was, there's another Christian school. I forget what it was. Right. Yeah, but there's another one. So... So they take all of you, your grandparents, now it's all you and your brothers and sisters? Yeah. So you got three brothers and sisters, right? I got, yep, I got an older sister, I'm the second, and then my brother, and then my little sister. Okay. 
So there's four of us. So all of you are with the grandparents. All of y'all are going to school there. Yeah, all of us are going to school there. Um, so my grandfather, he was born in 1941. Mm-hmm. He was born in 1941. He was in the Navy. He lived a really rough life, a really, really rough life. And he was very abusive, very, very abusive. Um, and I have always been like, you can ask anybody in my family, anybody in my life that knows me. I've always been like, you can't shut me up type of person. Like, I'm not going to shut up for nobody. Like, and that's just how I've always been my whole life. And I get it from him. He's the same way. He he's. I'm gonna say how I feel. I'm gonna speak on how I feel, and I don't care who doesn't like it. If I hurt your feelings, I apologize, but I really don't care. Mm-hmm. And that's where I got it from. So my whole life growing up, I would say how I felt, and sometimes it was not what I said; it was how I said it. Right. But I didn't understand that as a kid, so I would get beat out of me because it was like, why are you like you're you're too smart type of stuff. Like you're too smart. Boom and smack me what's up guys i hope you're enjoying this episode don't forget to smash that like button for me if you are leave a comment let us know what you think about Jax's episode right here now before we get into the next part i need you to know that some of this is going to get difficult to hear some of this is uh very descriptive and i did my best to make it as g-rated as possible so i hope you continue viewing and uh let me know what you think in the comments so for a long time, like everything was played like the I'm telling you, like my my little brother and sister and my older sister, they would be like they would feel so bad for me because there was so many times that I would get my ass beat and it wasn't even my fault. I didn't even do it. I was hmm. just the blame. And they would they would they you became would became a scapegoat. Oh, yeah. Every time. Oh, yeah, every time. And I, I'm not throwing shade. Rest in peace to my grandfather. You know, like right. he lived a hard life. And I remember a couple of times he would tell me, like, you don't know what abuse is. You don't know what abuse is. This ain't nothing. This ain't nothing what I'm doing to you. Yeah, He was like, I remember one time he was beating the hell out of me. And uh, it, I didn't I didn't ask to be excused from the table from dinner. So that was a big thing with my grandparents' respect, manners, mm-hmm. all mm-hmm. of that. Like, they just did not play. So uh, and my chores, we had chores. So my chores were was the dishes every every day. I don't ain't no dish in the sink type of stuff. So we eating dinner. I'm not even thinking. My mind's all over the place. Like my life is rough. I want my mom. I don't want to be here. I hate it here. And I just got up. I just got up from the table. I was finished with my food. <clears throat> Go to put it in the sink, and he didn't even say nothing. <laughs> he didn't even say nothing. He got up, grabbed me by my hair, and slammed me. And he was like, you didn't ask to be excused from the table. And I'm like, oh, shit, I didn't ask to be excused from the table. I'm sorry, Pappy, I'm sorry. And when he slammed me, I hit the corner of the like the kitchen, the kitchen corner, and mm-hmm. it bruised my face mm. completely. And I was in, <clears throat> I was in third grade. Wow. I was in third grade and I had, I still remember it. I had a teacher named Miss Emery and I loved her so much. And I went to the private school, so I couldn't wear makeup. I couldn't have like nail polish really? or anything like that. And my sister, Jenna, she put makeup on me that day. She to put cover makeup. Up the bruise. Yeah, to cover the bruise up. And I went to a Catholic school. So I get to school. I'm not. I'm a kid. I'm over it now. You know what I'm saying? That happened right. the other day. I'm right. not even thinking about the bruise on my face. I'm mm-hmm. not even there. And my teacher's just looking at me funny. And I'm like, that's when I started getting nervous. And I'm like, oh, like you're you're looking at me funny. So they turn all the lights off and it's prayer time because, you know, we praise and worship and do mm-hmm. our prayers and say our rosaries and stuff. And I remember sitting there and she was like, honey, can I can I talk to you outside? And I'm like, yeah. And it's dark in the room, so I'm like, she can't see nothing. Like, it's cool. I'm good. She takes me to the bathroom and washes my face. Hmm. Takes the makeup off my face and asks me why I have makeup on. And I was like, oh, me and my sister, we were playing in makeup. Um, I'm sorry. Like, I thought I was going to be in trouble for having the makeup on the yeah, whole the whole time. Think That's think about a, the abuse. Yeah, I didn't wasn't think even... about, like, this came from my stepfather. That's Well, that... my grandfather. Right, my well, gra- grandfather, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's okay, yeah. Or, yeah, you didn't even think about that no, as a kid. No, I'm thinking I'm about to get written up and get an infraction mm-hmm. because I have makeup on. And then 
Granddaddy's going to be mad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then I'm like, oh, I'm going to go home and get my ass beat again. So, <clears throat> um, yeah, they called CPS right then and there. Hmm. As soon as she saw the bruise on my face, she called CPS. So probably if you would have went in there and just been like, this happened, and me and my adult, you know, whatever, we were playing, this happened, they probably wouldn't have cared because they would have thought it was, but since you were covering up and hiding it, they knew there was something there. Yeah, yeah, and it was it was immediate. There was like, something's going on. Mm-hmm. Something's going on. So, and I would, I would show up to school with bruises all the time. Like, bruises on my arms, bruises mm-hmm. on my legs. From the same type of things? Yeah, yeah, from getting my ass beat, from falling into stuff because I got my ass beat, um, from, yeah, just being a kid, being rough, you know, being outside. We And that was another thing. We was the kids that we right. had to be outside. Yeah, right, because that's, that's kind of what I was getting at. Because sometimes you just get beat up from riding yeah, a bike or yeah. doing a skateboard or whatever kids get into, yeah. they get bruises. yeah. Some of them was abuse. Some of them was just roughhousing. I had brothers and sisters. We fist fought all right. the time. <laughs> we was we was knockout, drag out type of siblings. So I get I get to school. She un, she discovers the bruise on my face. We had a we had a nun for a principal, hmm. and uh, I remember Sister Bernadette coming in, and she was like, "Baby, I'm gonna take you. I'm gonna take you to her house, which is like this little chapel behind Sacred Heart. She lives on campus, so." I remember going like I felt I felt special because I was going into my principal's where she lived. My right. principal lives here, so I'm just like, "What's going on?" And then these these people walk in, and I'm like, "Hi, who are y'all?" They're like, "Hi, honey." They got a they got a recorder, and they got notepads, and they got a police officer with them. And I'm like, "I'm in trouble now." For um, makeup. Yeah, I'm in trouble now. So they start questioning me and asking me, and <clears throat> I told it. I told it all. I told it all. I was like, yep, this is what he did. Mm-hmm. This is why he did it. Mm-hmm. So, do you think you had an understanding that you were telling on him or that it was wrong? Or do you just think you understood in your head, this is how life is? This is- I thought that's just what it was. Right. I just didn't think it was a big deal. Like, yeah, he beats my ass. Okay. Like, I'm used to it. Like, I didn't think that I was, I didn't think I was getting him in trouble. And I didn't think that I did, I didn't want him to know. I do remember not wanting him to know that I was telling. Mm-hmm. So I had asked them, like, are you going to are you going to tell him that I told you? And they were like, no, we're not going to say anything. We just want to make sure you're OK. Like, you know, feeding me, feeding right. me to get more out of right. me, really manipulation, really, because to an extent, uh, you know, what I mean, I feel like it, you know, you got to have 100 percent. Yeah. Yeah. One hundred percent. But very good at manipulating a child's mind to think that, oh, nothing's going to happen. Like, you'll be okay. And it's like, "Mm, I wasn't okay. One of the most important things I think I've learned from all these podcasts is that 90% of what what creates us is our childhood. Mm. And we don't understand that our childhood is whatever it is until we grow up. Because, like, and and it made me think more about, like, in comparison to other kids. Like, when when I was a kid, did I think about how their life was? I, I didn't really. At all. You know what I'm saying? Like some of them would live in this trailer park or some of them would have this uh, beautiful mansion. And I never really associated that with how they were being brought up or how they were treated or drug addiction or any of the trauma that's caused from our childhood. Right. And it makes sense. Like it really is a cycle of life. It It really is a cycle of life. And it, it all it all it all goes into play. It all feeds into itself like it literally is comes full circle mm-hmm. with everything. Like when you look at certain families, like you could have the perfect family and then you give that kid everything they want. And they become spoiled and then they get addicted to drugs. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like there's so many different scenarios in life with the way that paths take us mm-hmm. like it just. Your childhood definitely it shapes a lot. Oh, it it's is so who, important, man. I've never, never really thought about it as much as I older. have until I started doing this. Yeah, yeah. Cause yeah. it shapes who you are, man. It does, and you're either gonna overcome the hard times and be better for it, or you're gonna fall into Succumb the same it, holes, yeah. man. Yeah, that part. Yeah, that part. It's definitely an interesting thing to think about how it sets your whole life up. Yeah, and it, and, and it for really anybody does watching, train it's your like, mind. Yeah, right. And for anybody watching, it's like think about that. Think about all the people that you know. If you're watching this, you're going to see these people and how it shapes their life. And think about that when it comes to your kids. Yeah. Like, what are you doing with your kids? Yeah. How are you? Because I fail. Like, care more about your kids. Right. Care more about the direction you take them. Teach them proper habits so yeah. that they don't become fifty year old 
people living at their mommy's house where they have no job and they pay no bills and they're taken care of because it, it, it becomes that man. It, it really does it does and also like you can't base everything off of your emotions like sometimes you gotta you gotta leave out your emotions and how you feel and care more about the, the kids that you're raising right like i had to learn that that was a hard lesson for me to learn mm -hmm. like who cares about me like i've already grown up like this is her time growing up. Like I have to, I have to yeah, care more about absolutely. her. So I think that I also think that what you go through as a child, just like you said, you either become it or you get completely mm -hmm. away from it. So I was like, mm, no, I don't want to do right. this. So CPS came, they did what they did. And, uh, they interviewed my sister, Jenna, and they interviewed all of us. They interviewed all of us because they was like, okay, well, if she's saying this, let me find out what the other siblings right. are saying. Right, because basically if, if two or three kids are backing up the same story, there's got to be truth yeah. to it. Not everybody's just lying. As yeah, kids. and my right. sister, um, my little brother, he, he said what it was. He was like, yeah, he, she, he, she gets beat all the time. Mm -hmm. My older sister was like, nothing happened. Yeah, hmm. Jenna was like, Nothing happened. I remember when I got home, I was so scared because she put fear in me because they let us talk after she came and see me and she checked on me. She was like, what did you tell them? And I was, she was in the mindset that we're in trouble now. Right. Like, How old was she then? If I was in third grade, I'd say, what was third grade? Like eight, eight, I guess. nine, 10, 11, 12. Really? So she's starting to be conscious about what it is, too. Yeah, though. 12, 13. She was but, in middle school. But so. she's also been removed from mom and dad and taken to grandparents. Maybe she feels like we're getting ready to be removed again if we don't tell them about this abuse. Cor correct. Correct. And it was another thing. Like, she didn't want no more problems. Right. Like, I don't want to go home and watch my sister get beat on because right. she told. Right, she's, right, right. That, too, huh? Yeah. Like, that was her main thing. Like... I don't want you to get hit again. Like, why would you tell them? Like, he's just going to hit you again. So that was like, ugh, she, she, she regretted it later. Like, I remember like growing up and like being adults and her mm -hmm. telling me like how sorry, like she would cry over like everything that happened to me as a kid. So I do remember that. But uh, yeah, she lied. She lied. And she was like, um, nothing happened. My so sister. She's you think she's lying, just being like, go away, police. We, I don't yeah. want anything worse to happen. Yeah. This is what her thoughts are. 100%. I can send them away. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, it, it was like a protection thing. Gotcha. Like, she was scared that something was going to happen. So then... Um, you can totally take them off if you oh, want. Oh, no, you're good. I okay. like hearing myself. Okay. But um, so then they, they end up going to my grandparents'. They end up going to my grandparents and I, like my trauma makes me forget a lot of it mm -hmm. um, because I block it out. So it's hard for me to like remember all the details, but I do remember because we lived in West Virginia. We lived in Cape and Bridge, but they would take us to school every day. So we paid out of state tuition, all of that. Mm -hmm. So I remember the social services was from West Virginia. It was DSS. Okay. So I remember going to Romney and sitting in this room with this long table and all of these workers in there. And I remember them having my grandpa in there and my grandmother. And I remember the tape recorder again. And I remember them interviewing us again. And I remember shutting the hell up. Mm. I remember not saying. Right. I remember saying I lied. I remember saying, like, I don't know why I lied. That didn't happen. I fell. Like, so I'm doubling back on my story. Of course. So now they're looking at me like. This. And they know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They, yeah. they like, she's saving him. Like, this little mother is really, mm -hmm. like, she knows what's going on. And, mm -hmm. and, and that's, like, also, like the unconditional love that a child gives mm -hmm. like you you With can no beat me yeah you can beat me but i'm still running to right. you and it's like damn, almost like a like, dog or, a, yeah. or an animal of some yeah. sort right because yeah. we don't understand they don't a dog doesn't understand there's another life just like a child he mm -hmm. doesn't understand there's another life at all right so they took take you out of there no or? Okay. no we you, stay yeah we so stay. cps just drops it based on you Lion, lion, the second time. Yeah, lion, and I mean, oh, I, that's I interesting. Think I, 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 
and you know the trauma like it's I was I was a little kid too, so I don't know if they had to go through anything parenting classes. Like I don't remember any of that. Okay. So like if anything did happen between them having to do stuff, but all right. I know is they kept us. They kept us. They right. got to keep us, and I walked around on eggshells for a long. So when you time. get home, like what happens then? Like are you in trouble with him? Yeah, then? hell yeah, I'm grounded. I don't get to do shit. I don't get to do shit. I'm grounded. Uh, <laughs> I'm walking on eggshells. I'm. I'm miserable. Right. I'm miserable. Right. Like, I'm the problem child. I always was the problem child. Like, that wasn't even the first time. Like, like I told you before, like, loudmouth Jackie, like, that's what they would call mm-hmm. me. Like, you can't shut your mouth. You can't shut up. And I'm still like that to this day. So that's just me. Like, and even, like, beating on you, hitting you, that wouldn't stop oh, you. Oh, hell no. Huh? Hell no. How did that make you feel when he hit you? Like, if I you're... wanted to hit him back. Okay. I wanted to hit him back. So early on, you wanted to... You wanted to get back at him. Uh, for early on, I would, I would, I would block. Right. I would, I would. Oh my god, I would shake. I would cry. I would, I would literally be like, and ah, oh, I just couldn't imagine like my child folding up in a in a ball mm-hmm. and me still just them up. No, you know what I'm saying. So it's like now Any when I look, child, I don't yeah, know, like yeah, and when I look back own. on it, I'm like. Damn, like, how could you do that to me? You know, like, do you think that was something to do with like the way we were raised back then? Like, the way he was raised, 100%. born in 41, like, it was 100%. a rough time. It's not like that nowadays. 100%. I mean, he told me stories about how he would, oh, how he would get thrown in like a coal bin mm. or like something under the ground and be left for days. No food, no water, no light. Like, oh, well, he was like, that's abuse. He's like, that's abuse. What you get done to you is an abuse. It's so weird to think about how that brain was working, though. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because the trauma of his life, you know, his childhood. The foster like homes, we were, right. the men, the his, his mom being with, you know, different men mm-hmm. and he was in foster care and he was the, the, uh, the physical and emotional and starving him and all types of other things. Plus, he was in the Navy. I mean, he went through some. So it's just like. It's just crazy how he would think that that's okay. And it it just makes me wonder for a second, you know, is it based on what he did? Because he's obviously saying to himself and to you, it's nowhere near as bad as what happened to me. 100%. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, be lucky. Instead of thinking, I don't want to ever treat someone the way I was treated. He just thought he was was, in the middle. Yeah, but he was also um, zero to 100. Okay. As soon as. Quick tempered. Oh, very. Oh, very. Pissed off. If I mean, I remember he was he's pissed off at my grandma if she didn't have potatoes on his plate every night. Like he needed to have potatoes every damn night. And if she didn't make some sort of potato, mm-hmm. she was getting cussed out. Mm. So Did it was, he hit her? Never. Um, <sighs> there's always been um speculations like but she never seen her I, bruised up or... no 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 no. there's been times where she's like had black eyes and it's like my nana fell like or something like that but i never saw him like beat on her but i do know that like growing up like he would beat my uncles like he would fuck my uncles up hmm. yeah so i i know that but like my mom was his baby she was the little girl she was the last born she was the baby so my mom was spoiled rotten and that's where i think her getting everything that she got out of life turned her into who she was as well Mm -hmm. like that's why i said what i said earlier about you could have everything you want and still become a drug addict or you could still fall Mm -hmm. into so that kind of changes the whole outcome too because it's like he raised her too he raised your mother raised them all so he spoiled your mother spoiled the hell out of her mother becomes a crackhead now he has mother's daughter. Here's yeah. my second chance. Maybe if I beat her, she won't become a crackhead. You maybe think that's what's going maybe. on in his head. I think that uh, he had a lot of hate and rage towards my dad too. Oh, okay. Yeah, he hated my dad. He hated my dad. I mean, I remember one time watching mm. him take a pair of pliers to my dad's head. Like I remember it because he found out that they was taking yeah, that's money. That's such a struggle there between the dark and the light, right? Man, like, uh, yeah. So think about it, like this is my daughter's kid, but I hate him. It's part of him too. Like yeah, how does and then that go? you also have the child that just doesn't shut the hell up. Right. So now you're you're that, and maybe that reminded him of one of your dad. I think it was. I think it was more of maybe, maybe, 
maybe it was that I, I reminded him of, I just know that anytime he said, I know that he was really pissed off at my mom for a long time. Like he was, he was pissed off at my mom. Like you're my daughter. I gave you everything. I did everything that I could for my kids. I built this life for you guys and you're fucking me over. You're stealing from me. I'm raising your kids. Like, I think he was just mad at the whole mm. entire situation. Mm. Mad like, at the world at that yeah, point. yeah. Because he worked so hard and, and created wow. this life for everybody. And he felt like y'all just f***ed it up and f***ed on me. Right. Like y'all, like look at everything that I built and I did for you and y'all just don't care. And it's like, there was really only one that did. And that was my Uncle Tim. My Uncle Tim, like, yeah, he might have did his college party in days, but Mm -hmm. he was the one that was like, I want to say like the perfect son. Like, I want to say like the perfect son. I want to say like he was the one that, and this is just from like my point of view. You know what I'm saying? Like my point of view as the the little girl that Mm -hmm. I was. Like I'm looking at, I got my Uncle Tommy, who is a drug addict. Then there's my Uncle Timmy, who is raising his three kids, is married, goes to church every Sunday, works his ass off, well-mannered, very respectful. His kids are great kids, does everything for his family. I mean, my aunt and my uncle have never missed a birthday or a Christmas for us. Like, I mean, every year, even as a, as a 29-year-old, I mm-hmm. get a birthday card and a Christmas card from them. And I always have my entire life. So you got the good one in the middle, and then you got the two drug addicts on the ends that mm-hmm. are just like up for everybody. And I think that it was just everything going into it. And I just, my mouth was bad. Like, I'm not saying I was like a disrespectful kid, but I just didn't know when to just shut up. Like, he's telling me something and I'm like, well, why? You know what I'm saying? Or like the way I say, okay, or no, sir, or something like that. And it would just trigger him. Like, and then he's throwing hands. I remember one time he threw me through a screen door. Mm. Threw me straight onto a patio through a screen door. I remember one time we were at we were at a our family owns this house on on the beach and uh we go every every summer for 4th of July our whole family goes and camps out, throws up tents and just gets it all weekend. And I remember one time my eldest cousin was I guess my brother had said something smart to her, so she chasing him around with the hairbrush trying to hit him. He runs into our our RV, locks all the doors, locks her out of it. Well, when he comes out, all the doors are still locked, mm. so locks us out of the RV. Mm-hmm. Um, we got a build up stand up shower outside that my grandfather built for us to wash all the sand off of us. So I'm naked in this shower because I just came back from the beach, not even knowing what the hell is going on. I'm naked, and all I hear is him yelling. I come out the shower, and boom, slams my head right up against the RV. And I have no idea why. I'm like, and beats my ass in front of our whole entire family. And my mom was there, and I remember her spazzing. I remember her spazzing, and I remember everybody, like, flipping the f*** out on him. And this was after the third grade bruise on my face. This was, I was older now. And I'm just like, why did he hit me? Like, he thought I was the one that locked the camper up. Nobody could get in it. Now he got to figure out how to get the doors unlocked. So he's instantly pissed as soon as he sees me. Boom, slams my head into the side of the camper. And I'm like naked in front of everybody, like holding my head. Like, what the hell just happened? But I'm a kid, so I'm like, shut up, Jackie. You don't want to get your ass beat again. And I didn't even do anything. So I remember, like, all my family, like, that's when they seen it. That's when they were like, he does f*** her up. He, that, that was true. She wasn't lying. And that's when they started to, like, peep it. And they were like, oh, like, this hmm. really, she didn't even do anything. She did nothing wrong. So I remember my, my my cousins that live there, still to this day, they talk about the story. They still talk about that story mm. and how they felt so bad for me that day and they just wanted to protect me. And But they all loved him so much. He was a great man. Everybody loved him. And I'm, I'm not taking anything from him because I, I love him and he is a great man. And that's where the unconditional love of loving your parent comes in. So mm. it's not about bashing him or anything. It's just what, it, just what happened. Mm-hmm. It just is mm-hmm. what it is. Mm-hmm. And... um. That I think that was the day that my mom was like, I'm getting you back. Like, I'm going to get you back. Like, I'm not going to. 
Like, I even remember one night. Uh, you know, I'm going to stop you real quick because I think it's cool that you see the fact that, like, all of that right there is probably what shaped your life, but you still don't want to disrespect him. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Like, he treated you like shit, but you still don't want to disrespect him. Yeah. How you feel about that? <sighs> Makes me emotional. Yeah. Uh... It's tough. It's tough. I felt like for a long time, um, yeah, I would I never. Video. Thanks. Um, I f I wanted to be loved. Right. Yeah. Um, I wanted to be loved for a long time by him, especially. Uh, I was always looking for his approval for everything. Always. Did you ever get it? Do you ever feel like there was like? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I did when he died. Yeah, when he died. Um. On his deathbed, actually. Hmm. Yeah. The night before he passed away, um, he said to me, ah, I remember, like, it was it was so rough. It was so rough. Um, my sister had died nine months before. And um, what was it? Three years before that, his son died, my Uncle Tommy. My Uncle Tommy was first he died first i mean i had death before that i mm -hmm. told you a little bit about it um my first real death was my great grandmother which was his mom my grandfather's mother i remember watching her be rolled out on a stretcher and i remember standing at the top of the steps and watching her leave because she ended up going to the hospital and she died later but that was like the first death I remember going to her funeral. But then um, the second one was my grandmother, my dad's mom. And that that me up, too, as a little girl, because I loved her so much. I loved going to my, my dad's mom's house. And um, she died of cancer. She died of cancer. And it was around Fourth of July when we were supposed to go to this big party for our family that we do every year. So my grandparents hated my dad. Still to this day, hated my dad. Um and didn't let us go to the funeral. Uh, they took us to the beach instead. Hmm. And um, that was fucked up. That was fucked up. Like, I, I, I can low-key understand a little bit of why you didn't want to expose us to that. But out of respect for our grandmother, we should have been there. We should have got to attend her funeral and being there for mm -hmm. her departing this world, you know? Yeah, right. So then shortly after that, a few years later, my grandfather, his my my grandmother's husband, my dad's dad, blew his head off with a shotgun. Mm. So that one didn't really affect me, though. Like, it affected me that uh, he killed himself. And I think that affects me now because mental health is real. And I know that them suicidal tendencies get passed down, even even if you wasn't in my life like that. I still have your DNA in mm -hmm. me and the way you feel and how you are, it's still, it's, it goes for <laughs> generations after you, you know? And my sister, my, my uncle overdoses and that, that, that's, that was like, you know, the start of it all. Cause my grandparents passed away. Your grandparents are supposed to die. Like, yeah, maybe not in uh. the way that they did, but Everybody says that too. We expect the older people to die. One hundred percent. So it's like, I don't want to say it didn't affect me, but it didn't affect me. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, it's sad. I miss them. I love them, but I also was very um, secluded from them. Like, I wasn't allowed to be around them a lot mm -hmm. because my grandparents hated my dad. So I wasn't allowed to be around my dad's side of the family or his parents. So. When my uncle passed away, that was the first time I ever saw my saw my grandfather cry. It was when my uncle died. And that was his oldest son. And um I thought that was gonna like change it, but it didn't for me and his relationship. When my sister died, that's when mine and my grandfather's relationship started to change. Okay. Because he was like that was his heart. Like my sister was spoiled rotten by him. Like she didn't get beat by him. Mm -hmm. Like she might have got yelled at and lectured and even my little brother and sister, they didn't they, they might have got smacked a few times, but nobody got their ass beat like I did. And my my sister and brother still to this day will be like, I don't 
I don't understand why. Like, I don't know why it was you all the time. And I didn't either. I mean, all I could, all I can say now is that it was my mouth. That's all I can say is like, my mouth was reckless and he couldn't handle it. He, as soon as I opened it, he wanted to smack fire out of me because just shut up. That's how he, that's what he would say. Just shut up. Just shut your mouth. Fire and matches. Yeah, literally. And, and, and honestly, now that I'm an adult and I look back, we're the same person. Like I, like his rage is my rage, mm-hmm. really, and it it's sick. So you got a quick temper that way oh, too. Oh, oh, do I? How oh. does that affect you? Like I can't put my hands on my daughter. Right. Yeah, I'll never touch my daughter. I'll never touch my daughter because of it. Because of it. Literally. What about like road rage and and just daily oh, life things? Daily like life. Yeah, I'm like quick. That? I'm quick. Oh, I'm quick. I will. I'm triggered. I'm very triggered. Very fast, but I've been working on it for years. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I recognize what I am. I recognize what I have and what I've been through. Mm-hmm. And I sit there and I have to take accountability for myself. And I have to say, I'm, I i can not become that. Like, that's literally how I feel about it. I'm like, if I, and there's been times, don't get it twisted. There's been times where I'm spazzing the out. Like I'm going nuts, losing my, I'm like, Jackie, what are you doing? Mm-hmm. Like, chill out. Like, and it's not that serious. Mm-hmm. It's not that serious, but oh, it's that serious for me. My brain doesn't work that I way. I can't stand that feeling when my ears heat up and my face gets yeah. hot and I'm flush and I'm just like, ah, I have to, I have to. Yeah. yeah. As soon it, as I get that feeling now, I try my best not to keep going. It, because it's addicting. Yeah. It's addicting. Rage is addicting. When you're mad and you're, it's very addicting. It's easier to get more mad than it is to calm down. Uh, and you're kind of getting out that's when Man. you start screaming or, or hitting or yeah, and throwing it, and it's like mm-hmm. it's literally at that point you're like oh, mm-hmm. i'm, I'm gonna yeah. act how i it's want a, it's a release yeah it's a release you have yeah. to find a healthier way to release yeah and i and that's that's something that i had to i had to learn i had to work on because it was it was way easier for me to just get more mad and more mad and take it higher and higher and higher than it was for me to come down so that was it, it's like an addiction it's literally like being mad and being enraged once you once you top it off oh you're going all the way to the top now once i already hit that level now i'm taking it as far as i can and that's something that i've had to try right, to control yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah. Ooh, simmer the hell down simmer yeah. the hell down I, I was bad for throwing stuff around when i was younger just and and even not even a couple years ago just flipping out over silly shit and yeah i just didn't want to feel that way yeah and like and that's where act. That's where you have to come to. Mm-hmm. Like you gotta, you gotta own it. You gotta be like this. This ain't it. This ain't it. So where do drugs and things like that come in? Oh, so um, obviously my family is full of addicts, full of it. And I always told myself, I'm never, I'm never gonna do that. I'm never gonna be that. I'm never gonna do any of that. But uh, I'll say I started stealing cigarettes in like third grade started stealing cigarettes started i remember being young my mom would keep marlboro reds in the freezer mm-hmm. keep them fresh and i would go in there and take a pack my mom kept salem's yes in the freezer. Salem's. I, i'd swipe quite a few packs of salem's yeah so my I grandparents would, too mm-hmm. so i would go into the bathroom and i did it because i wasn't supposed to be doing it mm-hmm. and because i thought it was cool i thought it was Mm-hmm. Thought I was the shit. Mm-hmm. Thought I was grown. So yeah, we we always did look at everybody smoking when we were kids. Like they was, <laughs> and they made candy cigarettes yeah, for us. Yeah, like shit I'm back it up. Like, yeah, like yeah, it was a whole different world. So I, that's where it started. I started uh started stealing marble reds for my grandma and my well for my mom, and um went went into the bathroom and. I don't even know how she didn't know because like the bathroom smells like a freaking pack of cigarettes. I smell like cigarettes. You're mm-hmm. kissing me and mm-hmm. you know I smell like cigarettes. And then she started catching on like, I'm missing cigarettes. Like who's stealing my cigarettes? Right. And I'm like, th- throw the whole pack away. Dumb shit. Mm-hmm. Like I, get rid of it. Just throw the yeah, whole pack yeah, away. Yeah. Like, no yeah. So wasting, obviously. So started with cigarettes. Um, I remember being probably like fifth grade fifth grade uh i got introduced to a water bong Mm -hmm. a water bong um i would i would see i would smell my grandparents smoking weed 
I would smell my grandparents smoking weed and they had these rules where like if you're in bed you can't get out of bed and it was because they was doing adult things downstairs well me being me Mm -hmm. I'm getting out the bed I gotta pee I need water anything I could think of to be nosy as hell and because I couldn't sleep so I would smell it I would smell it and I would find I would be nosy and go through their stuff when they weren't home and find it find bowls and find joints and I'm like, oh, this is a cigarette. No, the hell that's not. And mm-hmm. I remember the first time I hit a little roach. It was a joint. I was in like fifth grade and I thought it was like a cigarette. Coughed my ass off, was high as hell, eyes burning like a red flame. And I'm just like, ah, like high as shit. And I remember that being the first time in fifth grade. <laughs> and so did you, did you, like in fifth grade, could you look back and be like, this is what caused it. That little thing yeah. made me feel this way. Yeah. Yeah. And then that's like where like I got addicted to like smoking weed. Like, and people don't think that like you can be addicted to smoking weed, but I'm like, no, if I don't have weed, I fucking hate my life. Mm-hmm. Like I hate the world. So <clears throat> sixth grade comes around. I play sports. I'm in and out of sports, but I got this friend, you know, this is when I start to become rebellious as a like, I mean, I did not care. I thought I was grown. I thought I was grown, like thought I was grown. Mm-hmm. So I got uh, there 14, 15 too. You couldn't tell me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't care. Like right. that's, I was, that's the mindset. Yeah, like, I don't too. care. Like I'm gonna do I what I want. Yeah. And like, didn't even care how disrespectful I was. Like, and I look back like, damn, like, it was so bad. Like, if my daughter ever acted like, you know what I'm saying? Like, ooh. <laughs> Better never talk to me like I talk yeah. to everybody else. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, you're crazy. Like, right. So, um, started smoking hella weed with my friends. Started smoking hella weed, water bongs. I mean, I got, the first time I ever got drunk, I was in sixth grade. And I was drinking with my best friend at the time and her older sister who was in high school I think she was like about to graduate so they was partying Mm -hmm. and I'm like this little girl like "Mm, I want to drink alcohol and they bring some Everclear and some orange juice Mm. and I've never touched it since Mm -hmm. (laughs) I've never I've never drank Everclear since oh my god God, never again. Literally, I mean, sixth grade, I was 11 or 12. I'm about to be 30. I've never touched Everclear since. Literally. Something about alcohol when it smells a certain way and oh, just it, brings back that nostalgia. And you're like, oh, I'm ugh, good. I don't want no I'm parts good. to that. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I had that with Southern Comfort about 16. I got really drunk. They carried me to bed and puked all over myself. Can't yeah, touch it. Bush light. Like, ugh. I, ugh. Yeah. We had mattress in the front yard. We <laughs> bonfire going. I remember it all like it was yesterday. I had ate spaghetti beforehand. Like didn't have no clue what I was doing. Chugging this Everclear and this orange juice and felt like my life was over for the rest of the weekend. So never did it again. So started drinking, started <laughs> yeah. I was like, I'm good. <clears throat> and I played basketball too, so I'm like sick as hell going mm. into basketball practice. My coach Ugh. is looking at me like Jackie, what's wrong? I'm I know they had to smell it coming out right. of me because as a kid, you're poison. so, as a kid, you're like, I'm good, I'm good. And like, no, an adult mm-hmm. is going to be able to tell. Like if I, if I was, if that was happening with me and a child, I'm going to be able to tell. Right. So <clears throat> um, that started that. And then obviously like the trauma being around like my friends, a lot of my friends got addicted to drugs. A lot of my friends were addicts and just partying like i remember like being introduced to pills like i remember smoking pills i remember snorting pills Mm -hmm. i never like shot dope i never i didn't try cocaine until i was like in my 20s so i never i never did cocaine um but the pills i definitely tried a bunch of pills i remember Opanas, Opanas, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah, that that they one. A, they had a crazy mixture. A lot of people that liked their Opanas really liked them too. <laughs> so I had, I had a big thing with like I didn't want nothing in my nose. You know what I'm saying? Like I didn't, I was never, mind you, I'm I come from addicts. You know what I'm saying? So I was always the one that was like, I'm never gonna do it. 
I'm never going to do right. it. I'll smoke weed, I'll drink, but I'm never going to do it. Yeah. So I got peer pressured. I got peer pressured, and I remember smoking Roxy's around me. Mm. And I wanted to feel how I felt. I don't want it in my nose, so I like to smoke. Mm -hmm. Just light it up. So, smoked a few Roxy's. Never got addicted to it. Never got addicted to any pills, really. I just did them. I just partied with them. And mm -hmm. when my friends would have it, I would it do it. didn't become an everyday thing, though? Hell no. Hell right. no. Yeah, not, not for the pills. Thank God. Not for the pills. But, um... I definitely, there was a time where I was on those opianas and I was just like, I remember being so f***ed up one time, like me and my girlfriend just laying in the bed. And uh, it was one of the first times I had ever snorted it. And I didn't know how intense one was. Mm -hmm. I had no clue. And I took just like a little tiny piece off of it, snorted it, and was sick as a dog. Yeah sick as a dog hit that mucous membrane got to you quickly Whew. and i remember just holding i remember i'm like no joke i remember sitting in the bed like nodding out and i remember just throwing up all over myself but i'm so it was like i'm so up i took the shirt off with all the throw up in it and didn't drop any of it on me though mm. so you know what i'm saying like it was right. weird so i take the shirt and i took it outside and i remember just being like oh like, I'm gone. Like, I'm out of it. I can't even keep my eyes open. And I remember just sleeping for days after that. And then it was like, that was nice, but maybe I should do a little bit less. Right, right. Maybe I, I should do a little bit less. Do, yeah. So did it again, but did a little bit less. So then I was, like, feeling the high. And I got to ride the wave. And I got to, you know, enjoy it, right, I guess, right. per se. Yeah, most time you get sick the first time because we always overdo it. People mm -hmm. either get sick and hate it or they get high and love it. Mm -hmm. So I remember there was about a about a six-month period where me and my one friend were just doing pills, just doing pills all the time. Like, I mean, I was a server, and I was spending every dollar that I made every day to make sure that we had a pill, mm -hmm. even if it was one to share. You know what I'm saying? Like, Right, being a server makes it easy to... To cop a little money. Fast money. And and, doing... and I work in the industry. Right. I'm getting anything that I want. That's that's another right. thing people don't like to talk about. And bartenders definitely Ooh. have access to drugs. Man. A, <laughs> that an, a restaurant alone mm -hmm. has access to a lot of yes. things. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Mainly from employees or you feel like it's people that come in and they're drinking, they carry some Coke with them, they mm -hmm. got a pill with them, or it's the people you work with? It's people I work with. Right. It's people, underdogs, and people who don't have shit. I mean... The service industry is filled with all of that, all right. of that, because we don't have educations. We don't have we don't have educations. We don't have. I mean, think about it. Who who wants to who wants to serve people all day long? Like we don't have a choice. Like you know what I'm saying? Like I'm doing this because I didn't go to college. I didn't get mm -hmm. an education. Mm -hmm. I don't have parents that put me on a right track to college and doing what I'm supposed to. So this is all I. This is. The fastest and easiest way for me to right. make an ends meet. Right. So that's why people do it. And it's just like you look at certain people and you're like, yeah. And most times it's daily money, right? Every From day. From tipping is daily yeah. money. And, and a lot of addicts love to get cash right. every day. Right. I'm working for my I'm working for my, my addiction, really. Like I'm working to supply my need. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, I remember being like homeless. I remember being homeless with my daughter. And, uh sleeping on my friend's couches and me and my baby dad who argued all the time because he was like you're a piece of shit and i'm like you're a piece of shit because neither one of us had shit but we had a daughter and i always had her and i was sleeping on my friend's couches with her and i'm like you should be helping me and he's like no fuck you like you chose to leave because i had left him so uh pills yeah did that did that whole thing i mean i never i never took it too far i never took it too far i never went and shot dope or anything like that but i do remember sitting back and being like i don't want this mm -hmm. this is not what i want i don't want my daughter to be around this i remember it being christmas time and i could barely buy her anything and i think she was like two and i and i had spent money on drugs 
for months before Christmas. Right. So I'm looking at myself like, you dumb bitch. Like, all that money that you wasted on drugs. And your little baby is over here, like, barely going to get anything for Christmas. So it hit me. And I went and worked my ass off, like, the week before Christmas to get a bunch of money to buy her Christmas presents. In the same sense, got all that money, but still got me a pill. Mm Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, I remember Christmas. That's, that was priority. They had to get the pill to make the money to get the presents. So I remember walking around shopping for her highest on an old piano, getting her Christmas presents. And I'm just like, this is really my life. This is really what I'm doing. And I don't want to say that I was addicted because I could go without. You know what I'm saying? I just didn't want to. You know what I'm saying? I, di- I didn't. I wanted to get high. Like, I wanted to escape my fucked up life, my shitty life, sleeping on people's couches, didn't have a car, didn't have a license. I had been pulled over so many times, they wasn't even trying to give me a license back. So I was just like, "Ah, whatever. Like, this is my life. Mm -hmm. And then after walking around high as hell, buying her Christmas presents, I was like, I'm good. I'm good. I'm not living like this. I am good. And I... I never did it again. Never did it again after that. Um, what year was that? I want to say it was 2014. Okay. 2014. So no pills for 10 years. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Not at all. None. Weed, alcohol? Yeah. Cocaine. Okay. Um, yeah. So fast forward, I get my first apartment. Get my first apartment. Worked my ass off for it. Got my first little apartment. I'd, I had actually... My cousins, my cousins had taken me in. They were like, Jax, we got a room. Like, I'm not going to let you be homeless anymore. Mm-hmm. So move me and my daughter in. And then I started I started dating this guy. <laughs> Ended up being with him for 10 years. After I started dating him, stayed with him for 10 years. Okay. <clears throat> uh, move into my first apartment. He later on ends up moving in with us, me and my daughter. He had been around for a little bit before we made it official, probably like a year, like a year. So he's been in my daughter's life her whole life. Literally, he was my friend, cool, whatever. So moved into my first apartment, very toxic relationship, very, very toxic relationship. Um, It started off great, started off great, started off like, this is how I want to live my life. Mm -hmm. He was, oh my God, yes. Like he was the love of my life, I felt like, and um. He was everything that I wanted. Like, even in high school, like, I remember telling him, like, you're going to be my boyfriend. Like, you're it. You're going to be my boyfriend. I'm going to make you my boyfriend. And he would be like, you're crazy as fuck. Like, uh, I'm good, Jackie. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, no, like, you're going to be my boyfriend. And I remember being in ninth grade telling him all of that. So fast forward. A year after we graduate, so from ninth grade, a year after we graduate, he's my boyfriend. I'm like, yeah, I manifested you. (laughs) But uh, he was my friend for a very long time. So, And he was just, like, so quiet and so sweet and so loving and so caring. And, like, everybody loved him. Everybody loved him. He was went to church. He sang, like, has a voice of an angel. Um, He was just, like it for me like I was like this is it like this is who I want to marry this is who I want to have kids with like he was it for me he was everything that I wanted and um he treated my daughter so good like they loved each other so much they played all the time together and then um I don't know what happened I don't know how it changed I don't know it just did it was like you flipped on a light switch and it was like that life was gone like, that was never to be seen again. I mean, people always say, oh, the, the good always outweighs the bad. And I'm like, in my situation, I'm like, mm, no, the bad definitely outweighed the good. I just never gave a fuck to see it. And the toxicity rolled in and the abuse rolled in and the cheating rolled in and the lies rolled in. And then I'm exposing my daughter to one of the most toxic things that I think that I could have done to her um, that I regret all the time because 
like we said earlier, your childhood really does make you who mm-hmm. you are. So, and I think that um, I definitely played a role in the toxicity. I know I did. Um, I'm a very toxic person because of everything I've been through. And I'm always looking for the bad in everything. Like, that's how I was for a long time. I was always looking for the bad. Like, this, mm-mm. Nothing's nothing's too good to be true anymore. Like the the bad is always gonna come out, so go ahead and bring it out now. I'm not waiting around for it anymore, and that's just how it would be with it. Like it was just rage, being mad, yelling, screaming, bitching. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you don't do what I say, beca- I don't like it. Right. Well, it becomes a cycle too. Yeah. Right. Because yeah. it's like uh, Things are happening and it gets you to this low and then things happen that make you feel that high again. And it's the same circle as addiction. It um, is. And I've kind of just recently learned this, but like you're in that relationship and it's almost like makeup sex for example. Oh my God. You know what I'm saying? You oh know that when you get to that one point and you're arguing and fussing and fighting that there's going to be makeup sex and that's the high. So it's like you almost go back to this mm-hmm. point of making a fight just so you can have makeup sex. Mm-hmm. Fight, make a, it, it's kind of the same circle it of is. that type it of stuff is. because there's a high and a low. We, we're with each other and we love this part, but we hate this part. And we go from top to bottom, top to bottom, top to bottom. I think I, and I think I did a lot of damage to him. I think I, I think I brought out a lot of bad stuff in him because mm. of how I was. Like, and that's just being real. Like, that's just being real. So what do you mean, like, nagging with him, bitching at him for shit that he, like... Yeah, like, I think I pushed him to do a lot of the shit that he did. Okay. Like, I think that uh, constantly accusing him of cheating on me. Right. Bitch, you keep accusing me, I'm gonna go do it. You know what I'm saying? Like, but I, 10 years ago, didn't think the way Mm -hmm. that I do now. So, I'm thinking if I... And in your head, too, man, when you've been cheated on or something like that, it's like you're so defensive of not wanting it to happen again that you're, like, protective of everything. Literally. Like, you're looking at people that aren't doing anything, like, you're going to hurt me, you're going to hurt me, and you're scared they're going to hurt you, so you almost chase them off. Oh, my God. You almost make them hurt you. You push them away. You push them right out the door, literally. So that's a hard thing to understand. But then when they start to leave, you're begging and right. pleading and please and like you're dragging them mm-hmm. by their freaking mm-hmm. shirt to come back literally mm-hmm. and that's what i did so many times with him like this man i mean i did i i pushed him to do a lot of the things that he did and he was never abusive um and then turned abusive and i think that was just like also my childhood mm-hmm. i think that was like the you manifest fucking hit me, then. Like, right. hit me, hit me. Like, that's what you want to do so bad. Do it. Mm. Like, that's what I'm used to. So just do it. And I must gain your identity from that, huh? Yeah. It, yeah. It was like, it was, that's who I was. So it was like, I needed it. It was like, I needed it because that's what I was so used to. And that's, that's like the, the mentalness of all of it that it all plays a part. It all is a cycle. And it's just like, that's why I say what I do with my daughter because I don't want her to choose relationships or really like honestly I don't want her to become me like that's really like I know everybody says oh I I want my kid to be better than me but it's like no like I really don't want her to become me and what I am and the rage that I have and like I don't want her to feel the feelings that I feel. I don't want her to feel like everybody's against her and like nobody really loves me because that was like a big thing. Like you could tell me you love me, but I don't believe that shit. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that you love me. Like you got to prove you love me. And it's like, how do you prove that you love somebody over and over again and they're not seeing it? And then it's like, in my mind, I was beat on. So do you love me or do you not love me? Mm. And, like, as sick as that sounds, it's just, like, beat on me but then take care of me type of shit. And then that's how I'm going to know that you that you love me. Like, my grandfather beat my ass my whole life, but he made sure that I had clothes. He made sure that I had food. He made sure that I had a roof over my head. So it was like, yeah, I know he loves me, but he's not loving me the way that I want to be loved. And then I get into these relationships with these men, and they're not feeding what I needed. And it was because my mind was so trained to be this way that I never experienced any any healthy love from mm-hmm. a man. Like I never and and even when I did, I wasn't getting it. 
I wasn't receiving what they were giving me because I blocked it out. So it wasn't setting off that receptor. Though. <clears throat> no. You know what I mean, it's like that dopamine receptor is where you're getting it, and the abuse is what set that off for you. Yeah. It's like your drug. Yeah. So you can do all these things down here, but if you're not hitting that dopamine, yeah, and giving you the satisfaction because that's what it is, satisfaction. It right? is. It is. 100%. So where are you at with that now? Like, how's your relationship? To, do you have? A, are you in a relationship today? I'm not. Okay. I'm not in a relationship so today. So knowing all these things, what are you going to do in the next one? Do you think there's steps you can take or, or understanding will help you to, to generate a better relationship next time? I think that, yeah. Yeah, I think that I've learned so much from being in those types of relationships um that it's like i think it's me like honestly like being so fucking real like i think that i have to work on myself because if i don't love myself more nobody's going to be able to love me you know what i'm saying like i know that in my heart that i have to love me and i have to feed my own self and i have to give my own self love because if i don't I'm never going to receive it from anybody else. I'm never going to feel loved by anybody else if I don't love myself. And that's really the main thing. Like, I wasn't loving myself enough. Like, if you think somebody's cheating on you, why are you going to stay with them? Why are you going to keep accusing them of doing it, mm -hmm. but then stay with mm -hmm. them? Any any real person, not real person, but anybody that's real in their mind are going to be like, okay, if you're cheating on me, I'm done with you. I'm leaving. Mm -hmm. Like, that's how it works. Like, I'm not staying. Like, why would I stay with a cheater? But then you have people that have been abused and been through things, and they're like, oh, you love me. So you cheated on me, but you love me, so, so I'm going to stay. It's confusing. It's, it's very confusing. It's confusing as shit. It's so confusing. It's sick. It is sick. Yeah. Yeah. So I've had to really blame myself or what I put myself through because it's me. Like people could tell me they love me all day and I okay, all right, you love me, but I don't I don't feel it. And I don't feel it because I wasn't loving myself. I wasn't loving myself enough. And I wanted I would accept anything. <laughs> there was a point in time where I would accept anything and abuse as a child too, like sexually, like sexually abused as a child made me very hypersexual very very hypersexual and that was an addiction that mm -hmm. was an addiction because I was never satisfied like nobody could ever satisfy me it was it was never enough there was not enough sex that could set, satisfy me as a little girl really honestly like it's very sick and sad to think about but Hey guys, I had to take a little break from this edit to go to the store, but I just wanted to let you know that if you hit that like button, it sure would help the channel out. And also, before we get to the next part of this episode right here, man, I need to let you know that things are going to get a little harder to hear and a little bit more descriptive. I did my best to make it G-rated. So if you're enjoying this episode, man, leave a comment. Let me know what you're thinking about Jax's episode. Don't forget to hit that like button before you take off. And now, back to the episode. It's true. It's true. There was times where I got touched when I was little. I got touched and uh, he tried to, he tried to R word me mm -hmm. and uh, I still remember it. I still have the image in my head of how it happened and uh, it's fucked up. It's fucked up like it, that. I'll never I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that. I'll never forget the feelings of him touching me or him looking at me or him sitting me on his lap like and he was my parents friend he was my parents friend and he worked at my grandfather's business and he was my best friend's dad and he would sneak into the bedroom in the middle of the night and pull my little panties down and touch me or I would be taking a nap in the bed with his wife and he would come in there and take a nap with us and I would be in the middle and he would touch me under the covers and I would be wide the fuck awake but would be acting like I was sleeping. And I remember like... God, just torturing yourself in your brain. Yes, 100%. And that was before the abuse. That was before my grandfather was beating my ass. So that was the first real like... She's, she's fucked up. Like she's fucked up and nobody knew. Nobody knew. Nobody had a clue. Like... 
I remember pissing the bed. I remember pissing the bed and getting my ass beat for it. But it's like I pissed the bed because I was too scared to be awake. I was too scared to get up. I was too scared to let anybody know that I was awake because if, if I'm awake, then he's going to come in here. And people people didn't peep any of those little signs. And, and now that I'm older, like, I didn't even realize, like, I've talked to therapists and stuff, and they're like, yeah, that's like a defense mechanism that you did. Like, you piss in the bed is a sign of abuse, and I never even knew that. I never even knew that. And social services looks at shit like that now it, to this day. Like, oh, you're this age and you still pee the bed? And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, hmm. And they're looking at me like, you're abused and you don't want to say it. And I just remember the the last time he did it to me, the last time he tried me, and I was this little girl with this, I mean, you can only imagine, like, I'm, I'm a little girl. I'm a little girl. Like, I'm not, I'm little. Like, and you tried to fit your inside of me as a little girl. And I remember just, like, pulling the fuck out of his daughter's hair. Because I was like, this, this is, and this was another thing, too. Um, I would hit her. I would hit her and I would kick her and I would pull her hair when he was touching me because I wanted her to wake up because I was too afraid to tell him no. I was too afraid to say no, get off of me. Like I remember one time I told him to get off of me and he told me to shut the fuck up or he would kill me. And I was terrified and I was and I would cry because I never wanted to go over there and they always made me go over there. And then she was my best friend, too, so I always wanted to hang out with her. And she would cry if I didn't want to come over. She would cry. Like, she looked up to me. She loved me. She was a little bit younger than me. Still talk to her till this day. But, uh, yeah, I would. There was a point where she told her mom she didn't want me sleeping in her bed anymore because I always was hurting her. And she wasn't She wasn't putting two, two together why I was pinching her or pulling her hair like I remember like purposely doing shit to her like wake the fuck up and wa- and see this like somebody see this and she they make they started making me sleep on the couch they started making me sleep on the couch and then he would come out to the living room and have a fucking good old time do whatever he wanted did she ever say anything about him touching her never he never did he never did fuck. he never did um yeah, he never did. He never did. Um, there was there was the last time when I pulled her hair, I yanked her fucking head as hard as I could because I was like, he is really about to stick this in me. And I knew it. Like, I was watching it. I saw it. Like, I remember, like, him pulling me on the edge of the bed and having my little legs and his out. And, I mean, I remember... I remember the veins being in it. Like, I remember what it looked like. I remember it being hard as a fucking rock. Like, not knowing as a little girl what he was doing. But now that I'm an adult and I look back, I'm like, oh, you sick fuck. Oh, you sick fuck. And that was it for me. I was like, this is it. Like, I'm I'm never coming back here again. Like, I'm fucking done. I'm never, I don't care. I'll run away before I come back here again. Like, my parents aren't going to make me come here. My grandparents aren't going to make me come here. Because... And this is like pre seven, eight years old. You're seven, eight years old. <laughs> yeah. Very young. Cause yes. This is before you were taken from your parents. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then even when I got taken from my parents, I uh, still had to go there. Still had to fucking go there. Mm. Still had to go there. They they worked for my grandparents. They worked for my grandparents. And had everybody like he was a good guy to everyone else. Yeah. I guess right. I mean, yeah, he was he was a drunk, drug addict, but he was great. Like they loved him. Yeah, they loved him. And uh, he was abusive to his wife, though. He was abusive to his wife. He would get drunk and rage. And I remember the last time. I remember when I finally told the truth. I remember I remember one time. Uh, <laughs> we had, my grandparents own a business, so they all worked there. And um, computers, you know, they got computers. And I remember my grandfather having to pay somebody to come antivirus this computer because there was sound all over it and these motherfuckers said it was me hmm. 
because I would go to their house. So when I would go to their house, I would go have to sit at the office and wait for her to get off work, the mom and the dad. And they blamed me for all this porn on the computer. I didn't even know how to fucking look I up didn't porn. didn't even know what it was. Yeah, and my grandfather beat the fuck out of me for something that I didn't even know what it was. And he kept telling me, like, you know what you did. And I'm like... But I don't. What the fuck are you talking about? Mm. Like, what are you talking about? So, yeah, no clue. No clue. So, it was him, though. It was them. It like, had to be. It was him. It yeah, was him. Sure. You're watching fucking porn on the computer, and you're blaming me for it. So, got my ass beat for that. Um, and I think I know. I know that's where my addiction to sex came from. Like, being exposed to being touched and yeah. I mean him even putting his mouth on me like mm -hmm. and I remember like talking to my therapist about it like years and years later and I'm like but did I want it like why did I get wet like did I want it because like I'm I'm an adult now and when I look back I'm like I was wet and my therapist you know she had to explain to me like that's your body's natural reaction even though your mind didn't want it and you know like you're fighting your mind's fighting the the feeling of how good it felt even though it wasn't supposed to be happening so i was i blamed myself for a long time of why it happened to me like i literally thought it was my fault like i thought like i made myself available to him like i i blamed me i blamed me i remember my parents being drunk as fuck and drinking and driving and loading the car up with all of us and we lived back down apple pie ridge so windy ass bumpy ass road and this motherfucker has me sitting on his lap just grinding my coochie into his fucking leg over and over again like basically like humping his leg with my with my mm. with my shit and i just remember like how is nobody seeing me in the back seat and him doing this to me and my parents were fucked up. They were fucked up and didn't even notice that he was doing it. And I'm just like, I just know that like if it was my kid, like I'm, I'm peeping it all. Like I'm, I'm paying attention to everything. But that's their friend. They never would have. He has a daughter around my age, around all of us age. So why would he do that to me? And <clears throat> I just remember like, oh, and even after like people found out, he still worked there. He still worked there. He still works there now. No shit. I swear to God. He still works there now. It's crazy, man. Like, uh, I just don't. That That's one of the things that disgusts me more than anything is anybody that does shit like that. Like, I've sat at prison tables with a lot of people that's done a lot of horrific shit to, you know, other people, murderers and. But no one that's done that type of shit. Yeah. Like, that's, yeah. A, that's a whole different sickness. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta be a sick motherfucker. There's a whole different sickness, and and to not care care what you're gonna do to the person you're doing this with. Yeah, not at amazes all. Amazes me, like to give no fucks about how you're over your little. Mm. Yeah, right next to your own daughter. Right, and it and it does it does make uh, it does make women promiscuous. I Ooh, think. Hoo -hoo. I think it does. It does. And I think we can tie that back into the whole tra trauma of that same circle again. Like, there's a high and a low to it that's, uh, it's hard. you can understand it. Mm -hmm. Just like, why we go back to dope when we know dope makes us feel so bad? We get clean, but we go back to dope when we know that cycle sucks. Yeah. But for this, it's like, I haven't experienced it, so it's really confusing for me. But it's yeah. like that trauma that comes in, and then it's like, it's just, ugh. Yeah, it's a, it's a different level. It's so it's like it's almost like the trauma from them doing those things is something you want mm. afterwards, mm. even though right you crave that, it. How does that make you crave sense? It. Um, your mind, you manipulated your mind. Really, it's manipulation of the mind. Uh, that's that's what I think. I think that you expose. You got to think. Okay, so. Children's brains are sponges, right? The first seven years of their life, everything that they receive, they receive. They mm -hmm. take it in. Mm -hmm. Their mind gets wrapped around everything that they're receiving for the first seven years of their life. So if you expose a child to sexual trauma like that, it's 
embedded in my brain. It's programmed into my brain that that's what I want and I'm going to do it. So let me ask you this. How does that manifest itself? How is it? Is it you're seeking sex from people that want to have sex or because I'm trying to make a comparison here. Like that was sex that you didn't want. Correct. That makes you want sex that you do want. Correct. But you don't want sex that you don't want. Correct. So weird. It is. It is. And I think uh, when you're exposed to that at such a young age that um, it, it literally molds you. Like it literally makes you like crave it. Like Do you think it, it's because it made you, uh, let me think of the word. When that abuser looked at you in a way, they wanted you. Mm. Mm. <laughs> and as sick mm -hmm. as that is, bro, is that like mm -hmm. what you're identifying with? Is mm -hmm. they looked at me in a way that they really wanted me. Mm -hmm. And then and then also the pleasure that you get from it. Even though I didn't want it, it felt right. good. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Like right. well, you that's gotta think what, it's mean, your body's natural yeah, reaction yeah, to if yeah. you if you stick something in me, I'm going to get wet. If you're hitting a certain spot, I'm my young or not, mm -hmm. young or not, you mm -hmm. you are going. Your body is it's natural. Like you cannot help it. That's why when females are, they're, they're they still get wet. Like you, even though I don't want this, and and I, and you're hurting me, it I can't help what you do down right, there. Right. My body is naturally going to react to it. So even if I don't want it and it feels good. That's where like the psychological shit comes in because I don't want this. this so it's going around your thinking. Oh my god! Oh my your god! Your own body is going around your thought process. I hate this. I don't want this to happen. And then but when my you body disassociate, still too. responding. Yeah. Yeah, disassociating. Yeah, right. you got to think like I, I'm not here. Like mm. I'm, I'm closing my eyes. I'm pretending I'm asleep. So I act like none of this is happening to me. I'm acting like none of this is happening the entire time, but the whole time it's happening. And even though I'm trying to not be here, I'm still here. So it, that's that's a battle, too. That's a battle, too, because I'm in my mind somewhere else, but my body feels what you're doing to me. And enjoys it. And enjoys it. God, it's so fucking... It's sick. It is, man. It's, 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 it's so confusing, it, but uh, I don't know. Yeah, it definitely makes me think about a lot of different things. Yeah, yeah. This is a great conversation, man. I'm glad you came. Yeah, uh, thank it, you. It's Thanks shit that I've me. never thought about. I've never experienced yeah. or had someone open up as much about and yeah. i think it's interesting i think there's a lot of things that can be learned from from this episode for sure yeah 100 percent. like look at your kids yeah check pay the, attention pay attention to what's going on around there's so them. many signs especially with girls i mean even boys like you got to think about it too like i've even thought about that like kids that are boys that are gay now like were you touched mm-hmm were you touched? Because even though you didn't want it then, you're growing up and you're following a path that somebody you want a man. For you. Somebody started for you. Yeah, and that and that's and that's exactly what it is. You just said it. You did this to me, and now it's with me for the rest mm -hmm. of my life. You started this. You started this flame in me, and now it's that's what it is. Mm -hmm. And I think even even so, there was a point in my life where I was like, "Fuck men." You know what I'm saying? Like, I think I'm gay. Mm -hmm. I think I'm a lesbian. Mm -hmm. I want to be with a girl. Okay. I, I don't I don't like men. Men men will never touch my body again because of what he had did. So <clears throat> the sexual trauma comes in and now I'm exposed to even more sexual trauma because now I'm doing gay shit. Now I'm doing lesbian shit with girls. Okay. And I'm exposing myself to even more nastier things. You know what I'm saying? Cuz what little, you know what I'm saying? Like I started, I started being attracted to females because I didn't want a man anymore. I didn't want a man to touch me because of what he did to me. So now I only like girls in my mind. In my mind, I'm thinking I'll never let a man touch my body again. So because I got to be abuse, gay. Abuse came from a male. So I want to stay away from males. Yeah. But in reality, you go right back to it. You go right back to it because it's it's the cycle of life and it's like okay i was abused by a man so i don't want a man so i'm gonna go be with a girl but in the same sense when i grow up i'm so sexual that it's like oh right back to men and that's where i also like i've had 
friends that are guys that were touched by men that grow up and are gay and go right back to men even though they were hurt by a man. So it's like... Right back to the same circle. Again, yeah, you man. full circle. 100% full mm-hmm. circle every time. So, I, uh, yeah, I started experiencing with girls. And um, one of the biggest things for me was when I was... I... I was when I was growing up and I had I would think about it a lot I was thinking about it a lot and now that I'm an adult and I've been through therapy my therapist because he wasn't the only one now he wasn't the only one that touched me it's happened multiple times by multiple different people but he was the one that started it and um that's when I would think in my mind that it was my fault because why does this keep happening to me I'm allowing it And my therapist was like, honestly, like, once you're a victim, it's like you're always a victim. And predators can read a fucking victim. And they literally see you have victim wrote on your forehead and they know how to manipulate you and reel you in and do what they do to you because you're showing all the signs. You're showing them all of the signs. They they know what they're doing. They're predators. Mm-hmm. They're predators. They see it. It's written all over your face. They're reading your body language. Yes, one hundred percent. Confidence. They're reading what you say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I'm fast. I'm a fast ass girl because I was touched. So I'm being fast. I'm being promiscuous. I'm doing shit for attention. I'm putting myself out there, and then mm. it happens, and I'm like, why the fuck is this happening to me? Mm. So, through therapy, I learned, like, (laughs) once you're a victim, it was victim, 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 until you realize I'm not a victim anymore. You can't do this to me anymore. You can't use that against me anymore. And even though I was loudmouth Jackie and I talked all the shit and stood up for myself, when it came to being abused, I cowered down. I cowered down and shut the fuck up. Like, I was taught for so long to just be quiet, just shut your mouth. And that's when I would just be quiet and shut my mouth and just be somewhere else, literally be somewhere else, be anywhere but there. And in my mind, I would just be like wanting it to be over, like waiting for it to be done. Literally just waiting. And I, I just, I just knew when the last time was the last time. Cause I was like, oh, I'm, I'm going to fucking kill somebody. Like, this is it. This is never going to happen to me again. Like it will never happen to me again because I'm going to kill somebody. And the last time was the last time. So that was it. That was it for that. Like I started not really giving a fuck. Like I started, you're not touching me. You're not coming near me. I don't want to be around anybody. Started liking girls, started, I didn't trust anybody at all, at all, at all. And um, started having sex with my friends that were females. Started having sex with my friends that were females, like humping and touching and sucking on titties and doing all, all that type of stuff. And then I got my first boyfriend. I got my first boyfriend. And I don't even know how that happened, but I remember being in sixth grade, got my first boyfriend, and I wanted to have sex with him. I wanted to have sex with him, and um, I didn't. I didn't because I was a virgin. Mm. I was a virgin to everybody. I was a virgin, except for myself. And um, I remember me and my... Me and my best friend, the one that I smoked weed with, I started sixth grade, everything that we we started drinking, the Everclear story. Yeah, me and her, remember we both had a crush on this one boy and everybody liked him, but he was my boyfriend. And I just felt like I was the shit because he liked me and everybody liked him. Mm -hmm. And uh, we ended up getting really fucked up and he, he fucked both of us. He fucked both of us. <clears throat> the same night, uh, back to back. And I remember him using lotion as lube. Huh. Yeah. And uh, I remember just like laying there while he did it. 
and just now that I look back on it, I'm like, wow, like, wow, wow, you just fucked me and my friend, like, took our virginities and called it a day. And I remember him bragging about it to everybody. I remember him telling everybody about it and bragging about it, about how he fucked me and my friend. We were fucking 12, 12. And he was older than us. He was like 15, 15 or 16. And I remember him bragging about it to everybody and um, p- kids going around the school saying, like, we had AIDS. We had STDs. Because mm-hmm. they That's didn't know. That's how it worked back then. Yeah, so. Too young to even understand. Yeah, have no fucking clue. You're in sixth grade. People are finding out, calling me whores, all types of shit. And I'm like, little do you even know. You weren't even fucking there. Like, mm-hmm. I laid there. Like, I don't, like, you have no fucking clue. So, um... Even though I, this was my boyfriend, I had a crush on him. Like, it still was not fucking right. Right. So, um, I remember, like, it going around the school, and I was so embarrassed about it. Because, like, what the fuck? Everybody's called me a whore, called me nasty. Mm -hmm. I'm sixth grade. Why are you fucking in sixth grade anyways? That's Mm -hmm. fucking crazy. Little do they know all the other shit that I already have experienced mm-hmm. and been through. Right. Because they don't know. Back to the back to the childhoods. We don't understand what another person's gone through or been through or going through. Yeah. And uh, he was at a party one night and bragged about it. And my sister's boyfriend and her were at this party. And he was bragging about how he fucked these two little girls. And my sister was like, who? And he said our names. And she came home and grabbed me by my hair and was like, tell me right now. Like, tell me right fucking now, Jackie. And I was like, yeah, he did it. Yeah, he did it. And I remember her calling my mom because we lived at my grandparents. And I'm like, yep, I'm getting beat. I'm, I'm fucked. I'm getting beat. Like, this is over for me. My whole life's about to end. And I begged her not to say anything. Like, please don't say anything. But I'm begging her out of protection of myself, not out of protection for him. Mm -hmm. But she's saying it because she's like, this motherfucker is going to pay for what he did to my sister. Right, she wants him to pay. Yeah. So, And I remember her telling me how her boyfriend, Bo, like slammed him up against the the wall and choked him and was like, that's my fucking girlfriend's little sister. What are you doing? And I remember that. And I remember... um, my principal pulling me into the office and like she was like Jackie I hope you did and I denied it oh I denied it Hmm. I denied it like there I was like that never happened like he didn't touch me like it never happened I never did anything like I don't know why people are saying that like because I was so scared to get in trouble and in reality like I wouldn't have been in any trouble at all like but my mind is so fucked Mm -hmm. that I'm like I'm in trouble like I'm going to get my ass beat when I get home. I'm not going to be protected. I'm not. I'm never right. going to be protected. And uh, I lied to everybody and said it never happened until my mom called me. And when my mom called me, like, I couldn't lie to her. I couldn't lie to her. And I just broke down and I told her everything. I told her everything that happened, how it happened, what happened, who did it, when mm-hmm. it was, everything. The details, everything. And nothing ever happened. Nothing, nothing ever happened. Um, I didn't get my ass beat. She didn't tell my grandparents. Mm. She, she she kept it because I think she was scared my grandfather still would have, like, lashed out on me and uh, probably beat the fuck out of me. So she kept it, like, a secret between us, me and my mom and my sister. And uh, fast forward, I got a boyfriend and I was in eighth grade and started fucking him he was older than me he was older than me I was I started talking to him when I was in sixth grade and he was in ninth hmm. that's a big difference and then when Maturely I was anyways. yeah when I was in ninth grade he was a senior <clears throat> so I dated him until I was either a sophomore or junior in high school. I'd say, I'd say junior. Um, So my parents, rewind a little bit, my parents, they were crackheads, split, 
my dad really disappeared from my life. Really, like honestly, he disappeared from my life. Like he got a girlfriend. I would see him or speak to him like once or twice a year. Hmm. Disappeared from my life. You still don't talk to him? I actually have a very good relationship with him now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, just recently. Really. Just recently. Um, but then, no. Uh, he disappeared. Once him and my mom split, it was like he split with us, too. He couldn't deal with it. Um, he couldn't deal with having four kids with her and being married to her. And they weren't working out, so he said, fuck all of us. And, and dipped. And went and did whatever he did for 30 years. Nice. So how did you come back to rebuilding that? My mom died. My grandma died. Okay. Yeah. So, so you got back in contact with dad. Dad's not crack smoking anymore. Oh, no. He definitely smokes crack. Oh, he still does? He yeah. just got a good relationship. Yeah. He, he still does mad drugs. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, a no joke. I was literally came downstairs and he was in my kitchen smoking crack. And I looked at him like, are you fucking serious? And he was like, what? And I'm like. You're never going to change. All right. But the mindset that I'm in now, it's just like, oh, whatever, man. Like, I right, love you. Like, on. I'm I'm so fucking tired of right. losing people. Like, I just don't want to lose you. Like, right. and, and I don't want to regret not having anything with you because you will die one day. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. that's where my mindset is. I did the same thing with my pops. We fought for about three years. I made a relationship last six months and he died. And I'm glad I did. Word. Asshole that he was. I'm glad that I did. Yeah. So with all that, what do you do now? Like, uh, cause I got a piss so bad. <laughs> word, word. So, uh, like, uh, what do you do now? That you know, cause I think you're doing good, dude. You have a great attitude. Like, you're able to talk about this shit and and, and like teach people things. Yeah. Man. Continue to do that. Yeah. Like, I learned a lot just sitting here with you. There's yeah. several things that I learned that I still have to process. I'm gonna have to edit your video. All those things. So I'm sure it'll pound in my head by the end of this. But I think it's very interesting. Thanks. You know, you've been through a lot of shit, man. Yeah, you know? it's been tough. My uh, mom, her dying, all of that. But you're like, able you're able to to say this is what happened to me and this is who I am today. And I think that's important because anybody that's watching this has been through some shit. Mm. And we have to understand that on the other side of all that shit, whether it's yours or drugs or alcohol or family, whatever, trauma as a kid, like we can be something, right? Yeah. It's never too late to be something. To it, be happy. It isn't. It to isn't. be happy. Like I like getting up happy. Yeah. I like not worrying about all that shit that happened to me that I've done to myself or that other people's done to me. I'm moving forward. Yeah. And I think you are yeah. like you're a glowing light for that, that move Thanks. forward thing right there. That's Thanks. awesome. I'm and trying. I'm glad you came. I'm trying. Thank you. Thank you. So I wanna ask one question. If you had a uh, mission statement that was your mission statement. This is Jax's mission statement. What would it be? Oh, shit. <laughs> uh, I think it would be, um, it is what it is. It is what it is. Let it, you, we can't control everything. It's not, it's not our, it's not our job to control everything. Like we really have to keep it simple. Like keep it simple. Just keep it simple. It is what it is. And you really, like my grandma used to tell me all the time, like, be like a duck. Let the water run right off your back. Right. Like, you got to let stuff just go. Mm -hmm. Like, you just got to let shit go sometimes. Like, it hurts or it didn't hurt. It was beautiful or it was ugly. Like, sometimes you just got to let it go. Like, let it go. Let it be what it is. Because energy never dies. The energy you give is the energy you're going to get. And that's just the reality of it. Like, you, you can't give bad energy and then not expect to get it back. You can't put nothing but good out and not expect to get good back. Right. And I just truly believe that. I believe that you just got to let it be what it is. We can't control anything in this life but ourselves. And we all have a choice. Absolutely. We all have a choice. And we have to remember, at the end of the day, we have a choice. And it could be whether to take it for what it is or... Take it and make it worse than what it is. Okay. You know what I'm saying? So I'm going to ask you one more question. For anyone out there that's been through similar things that you've been through, you know what I mean, let's just say it's another woman, another guy, anyone that's been through this stuff, similar abuses, things like that, do you think that leaning into it and talking about it helps more than shoving it down and acting like it doesn't didn't happen? Yes. Yes. I feel like it's the unknown. It's the unknown when you seclude it and keep it to yourself. It's the unknown. I, I never would know all of this about myself 
Unless I did open up. Unless so I did been talk talking about, about it. it, being asked yeah. the right questions, yeah. bringing these emotions and feelings and yeah, going through therapy and uh, having an outsider who is a doctor or even if they're not a doctor, you know what I'm saying? Having somebody that has wisdom and knowledge in these things and then you open up and you talk to them and they can tell you like, hey, you're not crazy for how you feel. Like mm -hmm. you feel how you feel and your body reacted the way that it did because this is this is the way that it is. Like this is your mind. This is your body. This is your life and it's like some things that we don't understand like I didn't understand a lot of that until I got help until I got help and then it made me realize like oh because a lot of people blame themselves and they're like it's my fault that this happened especially women or men who have been taken advantage of mm -hmm. like we as a victim we do blame ourselves because there's also like that I, I guess you would call it like a, like the stereotype where it's like, oh, where people will be like, oh, well, if you didn't want it to happen, why didn't you just stop it? And it's like, oh, it's not that. Well, it's the same question as people look at addicts and like, well, just stop using, just stop, sm <coughs> excuse me, just stop smoking it or just stop whatever. And it's not that simple at all. And it's like with something like this, it's almost like. I put the drugs in my hand. I chose to do the drugs. The, I, therefore, I can't stop them. These things were not done to you because of what you did. Someone else did them to you, but you still seek them, and that's confusing. Yeah. And I think that if people know that, like, you don't have to come on a podcast and tell the Internet, but yeah. if you can sit in a room and tell someone and, and maybe yeah. cry a little bit. Maybe, or write it down. Maybe get some of this shit out of you. Let some yeah. of us carry it. Like, sometimes, man, people leave this podcast, and they leave a weight on me. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. Like, I feel a weight from these people sometimes. Yeah. They leave it here. I take it with me. Yeah. And sometimes it's a lot, dude. It's a lot. I believe it. Yeah. I believe it because it's like you, you're you getting it. You're taking it all in. Mm -hmm. You're taking everything in, and you're feeling it all. Right. And you're like, damn. And then you, once I leave, you're going to be thinking about everything we mm -hmm. talked about. And you're going to be like, holy shit, this girl, like, just told me some of her life. And... I can't believe that she's still here, like right. to talk about it. Like That's how it is. people say that to me all the time. They're like, Jackie, everything that you've been through, that like, how can you still smile? And I'm mm -hmm. like, why wouldn't I? And that's why I say that you're 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 the light for that because yeah. I, if you can come through all of that shit, and I know we didn't even get into yeah. half oh, of your not stories, not even close, like not even close. We could sit here for another three yeah. or four hours and you could tell me shit. I know yeah. that, but I feel like what you said is is very concise and well stated. And, and you painted a picture. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And that's what I wanted you to do. You painted a picture for people. And, and it's totally separate from addiction because it wasn't much about that. No. But it's about the trauma of our childhood that caused us to do other things, promiscuous sexually or using drugs or whatever. Yeah, trying you know, realize, to life. Yeah. yeah, realize that your childhood, good or bad, can shape your entire life. Yeah. And your kids. Yeah. The ones you're bringing up right now, it's going to yes. shape their life. Yes. It's important. Yeah, I think that's one of... I, I think her, she's she's also one of the biggest reasons why I am so open. My, my mom was very open with me, too. My mom, mm -hmm. like, I know some shit that happened to her when she was a kid that even the people that did it don't even know that I know. Right. So it's like her being so open with me has made me the, the mother that I am. Like, my daughter is in sixth grade, and if a boy has a crush on her, she's coming to tell me about right. it. Like she, right. I'm her best friend. Yeah, you're like, supposed to be. You know what I'm saying? Like supposed she's, she's coming, she's running straight. Like if she, if something at school is happening, she's going to the bathroom to call me. Like I gotta, I gotta call my mom. Like, and I've, mm -hmm. I've, I've made that for her because That's good. Just I've, keep that. I've also put her through some shit though. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like she's, she's lived through all of this with me. Like, especially the grief part, right. the grief part of, Losing my sister, losing my mom, losing my grandfather, losing my grandmother. Like, my grandmother just recently passed on Christmas Eve. So, like, she raised me. That's the mm -hmm. woman who, like, helped my mom raise me. And her going through all of that with me, like, she's got some shit with her, too. Yeah. Like, kids go through things that we don't even realize we put them through because we're living our lives. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So what social media apps do you use the most? Like, if someone wanted to message you, tell you your story meant something to them or maybe ask you a question uh, facebook instagram um under okay so my facebook is jacks long j-a-x-x-l-o-n-g uh in parentheses i think it says jackie long um on instagram it's at queen to a princess underscore 
And then I got Snapchat, but that's personal. Right, right. Keep gotcha, that. gotcha. Yeah. Okay. But like the the Instagram and the Facebook for sure. Yeah. Um, and I always tell people all the time, like, dude, hit me up, even if I don't know you. Right. Like, I don't care. Like, I don't care. Yeah. I'm such a give all the love that I have to everybody because everybody needs love. Everybody. Yeah. Everybody. That's what's up. Everybody needs it. There's not one person on this planet that doesn't need mm, to be loved or need sure. to feel it. Yeah. And that's why I am how I, I am, for sure. Yeah, man, I try to do the same thing. People reach out to me a lot, and I try to make sure that, you know, be upbeat and let them know, you know. Dude, it's so, yeah. worth, it's so worth it to, to move past all that and, and whatever it is. You have no idea what you're doing either. Like, you could save somebody's life mm-hmm. easily just Absolutely. by responding, mm-hmm. just by giving simple communication right well it's how many creators do you watch that you never reach out to and Mm -hmm. and when somebody does reach out to a creator they obviously feel a connection Mm -hmm. they obviously think whether you know you're feeling something from that person that makes you want to message them and i feel like if you're reaching out to me to message me least i can do is fucking answer that message right like come on yeah i try my best to keep up with everybody and my shit is long yeah sometimes i get done tattooing i got eight people in there but i'll go through there and spend an hour answering everybody you know what i mean man i try not to just you know push people off to the side but thanks for coming man Yeah, i think this was great this was awesome Uh, i'll let you know as soon as it comes out yeah sounds good i was telling everybody i was like i'm gonna go be on my on on a podcast my sister tagged me in it so i was like fuck it i'm gonna do it like i'm just gonna go do it like everybody tells me all the time like jackie just use your voice like just use your voice tell people your story and just like you said i haven't even scratched the surface like literally oh yeah barely scratched it so y'all know what to do, man. Hit the like button, subscribe, share, drop a comment. You know, all them things help this little channel out, man. I think she yeah. kept it super real today. I appreciate you being here. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having episode. me. This is cool. I'd awesome. love to do it again. Anytime. Awesome. Yeah, Thanks, for man. Sure. You're welcome. No problem. Ah, have a I good have day. Got you, right? So bad. right. <laughs>